episode 109, Meaningful Introductions. Welcome to Gratitude Geek, the relationship marketing podcast, helping micropreneurs find your micro-influencer magic. I'm your host, Candice Rodardi, and this week I'm joined by Swire Ho. Born and raised in Hong Kong, Swire immigrated to Los Angeles in 1996. He is a proud Chinese American who speaks Cantonese, Mandarin, and English. He trained as a sound engineer, working at recording studios and entertainment agencies before starting his own firm, Hellman Productions, in 2003 in Los Angeles. Swire and his team successfully produced attractive, personalized CD and DVD cases and custom merchandise like t-shirts, earning a score award in 2009 for a small business success. His business eventually grew so popular, he decided to sell Hellman Productions in 2013 to focus exclusively on the promotional products. Welcome, Swire. Thank you, Candace, for the warm introduction. I am really interested in ch- chatting with you because you have a lot of things going on and I can't wait to hear all about them. But first of all, tell us your unique story. How'd you get to where you are? Okay. My name is Swire. You know, if you want to go all the way back to the beginning. So actually my dad uh, used to work for a company called Swire Group. He actually named me after the, the company. So he might have wanted a promotion or a raise, right? So he named his firstborn child Swire. So I came to LA in 1996. I really want to be in the music and entertainment industry, but I don't really play in instruments. Uh, so I decided to become an engineer. And then uh, to start Helmut Production, you know, the backstory was uh, on the day of my honeymoon, I actually found out that the company that I was working for went out of business. So I was kind of forced to be an entrepreneur. I didn't choose to be in it, but then somehow that's what you have to do. Um, I think I'm a curious person, so then I'm able to keep learning more and what's the trend, and then somehow you know I end up you know being in Gorilla Promo uh, doing promotional products. Yeah, that's the short version of the story. <laughs> yeah, how much time do you have? <laughs> I know. So, so you com- you found out on your honeymoon that your company just went out of business. Uh huh. Wow, that's a pivot. That's because you you didn't even feel that it was coming down the pike. You had no idea? No, I still have fun, you know, on my honeymoon. But then like, uh, yeah, but then when, when you come back, there's no job. You lose your, your job and you know you know you want to start your own company. What's the thought process behind that? How do you decide where to go next? I was in sales for uh, the company that I was working for. We are doing similar things, uh, but then I decided not to keep the recording studio part and focus on CD and DVD replication because I'm located in LA. So naturally you think all these record labels, all the film company back in 96, that's when DVD are very popular uh, for listeners who don't know what they are right now. Um, so we get into it, you know, I had to make a lot of different phone calls and have no ideas how to start a business, how to set up bank accounts, how to do the incorporation. So find out uh, a lot of mistakes, learn it the hard way. But then slowly I'm seeing that there is opportunities out there. And then instead of, instead of focusing on finding the bottom price for what I can offer to my client, I find out how I can be unique, how I can be special. So how all this Asian background come in, because if you have seen packaging from Asia, they're a lot more fancy. They're a lot more elaborate than mostly what you will find at that time, you know, buying a, a CD. So I actually work with a supplier in Taiwan and we incorporate all the fancy type packaging, all the box sets that are available that uh, we haven't seen here. So we become the go-to company for custom packaging. That's a good niche. That's a really good niche. It's been 20 years. And yeah. I don't think that I have one CD or one DVD in my house. Oh, wow. I, so I still have some if you want them. I've never, <laughs> it's just a no, I don't. <laughs> I don't <laughs> want them. So you had to adapt. I mean, obviously you had to adapt again because CDs and DVDs went away. I mean, they're still out there, but they're, it's more of a niche collector's item now. It's not, I'm sure there are a lot more people like me that got rid of all of them when I didn't need them anymore because of the digital. I mean, I know digitals, those of you who are big music fans, I know that the digital sound isn't as good as you'd get from a, re- a record or a CD, but I don't want clutter. Okay. There. I had my, I had my yeah. say about that. <laughs> so well, in hindsight, got- it's, it's perfect, right? We, we, uh, we sold the company in 2013. That's where 
uh, when our internet got really fast. And then the this discrepancy of what you just talked about, you can't really tell if you are blasting the music in your car. If you're listening with headphones on, yes, you can hear it. But for most people, that's when the shift will be. So uh, we didn't time for that, but then thinking back, you know, that's the perfect timing. This is completely, I, I don't want to get into Joe Rogan. That is not the purpose of this, this comment that I'm about to make. But uh, one of the reasons why Neil Young doesn't like Spotify is because he doesn't feel like the sound is good and that um, iTunes has better sound quality from their digital, the way that they, they encode things digitally, which I find really interesting. I, we're not going to talk about Joe Rogan. Please don't think I'm going to talk about Joe Rogan. You know, get really political. I just, the comment from Neil Young about the sound quality from Spotify versus iTunes really surprised me because I don't hear the difference. So I think you have to have an ear, just like Swire said. I, to hear I agree. That. You know, like if you want to go deeper, if you pay for the premium, if you're paying uh, Spotify, you get the better sound. But then if you are, you know, getting the free service, uh, Apple iTunes and Apple Podcast sounds better. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So you immigrated in 96. You want to talk about why? I just wanted to go to LA, you know, be in the music industry. You know, that's where uh, the Baywatch and other, uh, you know, nice writers are. Let's talk about the whole reason why I wanted you on the show. And that is because you are all about making meaningful, uh, meaningful introductions to people and that you're speaking my language because I have based my entire business, really my entire business life since I was 20 something years old on the same concept of making meaningful relationships, make meaningful introductions, making sure that people know each other. And I'm not sure I've ever shared, or maybe I have because I've interviewed him. But one of my favorite introduction stories is about 10 years ago, I met a woman named Kim at a networking meeting and she introduced me to a, name, a woman named Joy. And Joy and I became really good friends. Joy introduced, introduced me to a woman named Lori. Lori introduced me to Brian Hilliard, who is the co-author of Networking Like a Pro with Iva Meisner. I introduced Brian to a woman named Jenny Bellinger, who is the, um, the host of the Badass Direct Sales Marketing Podcast. And Jenny introduced Brian to the son of one of the, the most successful network marketers in all of history. And he introduced Brian to his dad. And that was one of the most meaningful uh, connections that Brian has ever had. And it all happened because 10 years ago, I met a woman named Kim at a networking meeting. So that is the power of making meaningful connections and meaningful introductions. So Swire, dig into that. Your turn. Well, I think, you know, there's like a 10 step, right? you know, connection through there. And I think right now it's, it's important too. You got to pay attention of your, if you're in business, right? You got to pay attention to your surroundings, especially if you're on LinkedIn. You know, I keep a, I, I, I want to say I keep a tap on my client. I, I like to follow them, right? So I noticed that especially my clients in the tech industry, they have switched jobs three times already. Now we're working remotely. Now a lot more people are working virtually. Uh, they don't feel the connection with the company as they used to when they work at a, a office. So they switch jobs a lot. So why is this relevant? It's because if you stay in touch with them, if they order from you or they work with you before, that means that when they're at the new company, they can also use your service. So for me, that means that I can still keep the same number of clients, but now they're expanding, they are changing jobs, maybe they're, they're moving up. So if I keep those connections, that means that I don't even need to go out to prospect. I can just rely on people who know and work with me already, and then you know work with the new company. You are so spot on. You're so spot on. Even if you will never do business with that person, you, you don't know when you're going to make that meaningful connection, that meaningful introduction. So Swire's right. So, okay. So how do you stalk people on LinkedIn without being creepy? Didn't use that word you did. <laughs> but I think it's, it's, it's good that you check in with them, you know, because when we see, uh, let's say people have a new title, they, they started a new job. Uh, we just say, oh, congrats, whatever that, that it will be. You know, can you go a little bit deeper? You know that they're in a, at a new position. Uh, what position are they? Are they using the same company? Going back, you know, if you are in sales like me, maybe at the last company, they really wanted to use you, right? But then they have a long contract or maybe the owner's uh, girlfriend is the provider. So you can't go in. But now that person might have moved on to another 
company, they really enjoy working with you. Now is your chance to you know, break an introduction. Don't bombard them with uh, messages uh, in the first, I would say, month or two. Let them settle in and just reach out to see, you know, love to find out more about your role in your new company. Does it make sense for us to hop on a call for, for a conversation and just listen and see how you can help? You know, that's what the meaningful uh, connection will be. You don't want to be you know putting on your sales hat, but just finding out what what are they up to? You know, what are some of the challenges or the pain point that you could probably help and then you know go from there. Okay, listener, I want you to stop what you're doing right now, grab a pen and paper, rewind this podcast by two minutes, and I want you to get your notebook and I want you to take notes because Swire just gave you the formula for how to make meaningful connections on LinkedIn. So please rewind and take notes. Thank you. You talk about churning clients and customers into be into many advocates for your brand. How do you do that? That's uh, that's an add on for what we just talked about, right? So if you know that you know your contact is happy or satisfied with with your work, you know, especially if they move to a new role or a new company, why don't you let them to talk about you? You know, the way that you can do that is first, and we don't do that anymore. I don't know why, like it's especially since uh, we're doing virtual, we don't call people anymore. We send messages, you know, maybe Zoom call is that high, but then uh, after, after each job, have you ever called your client to say, I just want to check in to make sure that you're happy and satisfied with the work or products with them. Uh, are you happy? So we don't do that. We send out survey, right? We might offer like a Starbucks gift card, but then people just click and you don't really learn nothing. But what if you really call them to make sure that they are satisfied? Once in a while, they might tell you that, you know, I wish that you could do things better a certain way. Uh, and then we get defensive, right? What do you mean? Like our product is the best in the industry and blah, 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 blah. Um, are you willing to listen? Or uh, in the, we're in the time right now that when we call a call center, you know, they sound really great. They are scripted, but then you know that they, they're never going to change. They're never going to do what you're trying to ask them to do. But what if you change on your uh, customer's request? How would they feel? You know, then you, this is how as a small business, you can build the brand loyalty because they know that if I call Swire and I tell them that I want this to be changed, I'm not really happy. He is going to fix it, you know, Versus if I go to their competitor, maybe they're bigger, uh, they're never going to be able to change or get what we're going to do. So this is the first step that you can build the loyalty to your brand. And then if you know that they're happy, they're satisfied. The follow-up question that logically we ask is, do you happen to know a friend, family, or a colleague that can also use our product and services? Would you mind to uh, do an introduction for me? Then you can start, you know, building on you getting introduction, you getting referral for you, and then if you're smart, you follow up with knowing your client who they are, give them a gift that you know that they're gonna use. You know, if they are office person, give them something a desk item. If you know they're a golf person, give them a golf item. So then they will carry your product anywhere you go, and you have trained them already to know that they're satisfied. So when they're with a golf buddy, they're playing golf. Oh, who give you that golf towel? And then they will be your mini ambassador and start talking about how great you are and then things that you do. And that's how you can use one customer uh, to start making more introduction on your behalf. I want to talk about your, your uh, Instagram, your Instagram profile, because um, I always do a little research on my guests before I have them on the show. And I love that you are putting um, case studies on Instagram. So talk to me about how to, how to make a case study on Instagram and, and what, what a good, because a lot of people aren't using case studies in their excellent marketing tool. So what, um, and it's probably not you who's doing them. So, <laughs> so you probably have someone, you're, you're probably checking your Instagram right now. What is she talking about? What is it? What are these case, case studies? But case studies are a great way to, educate people on what you do and how you can help people. So, um, and then I've never seen a case study on Instagram before. So I thought it was a really good marketing piece. Can you address that? Or is that someone else in your office doing that? I, I can try to attempt, you know, okay. I actually, you know, we like, we do like to, to do case study. You know, I, I would really thinking about 
uh, what I just said, right? Some of our clients are more vocal and more happy and free of, you know, my our relationship. I actually do want to get them on like a podcast like we are doing right now. And I'll ask them, you know, to showcase their, uh, what we have wrote on the case study uh, in their own word, because why case study is important is because people kind of tune out on your marketing message. And as a salesperson now, sometimes I name the features and benefits. People, people tune out. But then if there's a third party or if it's just a happy client, tell people about their experience, how they were using uh, the product and services that we do to get ahead of what they're doing. People will pay attention. People will pay more attention to case study than what I'm saying to them every single day. And BNI, and is Business Network International. It's an, a weekly networking organization. It's the largest networking organization in the world. I belong to a chapter that meets online and, uh, and it has members from across the state of Michigan. It's a Michigan-wide chapter, which is kind of a new concept since the pandemic. Um, but we kind of, sometimes you run out of things to say in your commercial uh, and case studies are an excellent use for that 45 seconds that you have to talk about yourself when you, you, cause you're talking about, you, you don't want to talk about yourself. You want to talk about the experience of other people. I like to use emotion in my commercial because it's, you know, it's how you made the customer feel. And a really good case study is about the emotion of the customer, not just the results, but how the customer felt about what the great thing is that you did. So you're in promotional products. Talk to me about good uses of promotional products and not so good uses of promotional products. Cause sometimes a promotional item is tacky. Um, and, I'll let you dig into that and may, and then I'll add my two cents if I feel like it. Well, thanks for the tough question. And why don't I give you a case study, right? Uh, so uh, let me give you- You a are a first. smart, smart man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a client of ours, they are a commercial uh, cleaning company. So they came to us for a, uh, they want to create a different experience for onboarding uh property manager or uh, office building that are using the cleaning service. So we actually put together a kit that they will actually mail to every client that they sign on for, uh, for the, for the service. So because we are in a pandemic, we are scared to touch anything. So we decided we uh, provide a UVC charging for your phone and also cleans your phone at the same time. So people are really happy with the, the package. And then we also gave uh, all their client a desktop, vacuum so you can actually vacuum your desk. It's really small. So the end of the story, they end up landing um, their cleaning for after party for the Super Bowl on Sunday. So that's a really good, great case study. So I'm sticking with that forever. And that's how you can be unique. But then there are also some of a client that they have the logo, right? They just redesigned their website or they just have a new logo, right? They decided they wanted to just flood the market with all the pens that they have. But then you have to answer yourself and everyone look in the drawer. How, how many pens do you have in your drawer that has other people's logo on it? You know, when is the last time that you actually call their company because you use the pen? So I think uh, there, the, the message I want to get across is you want to be focused. You wanted to find out who your ideal clients are. Who are they? Where do they work? And then you can let me know. Then we could actually target everyone or we target, you know, your ideal client, which way do you want to want to be? You know, that is, you're absolutely spot on because how many people have a hundred, hundred million pens in their drawer. So the, the promotional products that I keep are ones that are useful. So uh, I can think of three things off the top of my head that have somebody else's logo on them that I have. And I use one of them is a stapler that I've had for 10 years. It's a little tiny stapler and it's got a logo on it. Another is a set of measuring spoons that get used almost every day. And the other one is a microfiber cloth that has a logo on it. And I, you know, I use microfiber cloths all the time. So I have one with a logo. I think that the microfiber cloth would get used the most. In, if somebody gave me a microfiber cloth with a logo on it, that would get used the most. This happens to not be logoed, but, um, but I even, I have one on my desk right now. They get used all the time. So um, Swire was right. He, that client, the case study he just talked about, they had a mini, mini vacuum. And when he put his fingers up, he, they were like two inches apart. Is the vacuum cleaner really two inches? Yeah. <laughs> They're small. It's supposed to vacuum your desk. And it's like a fun, like it doesn't, it's not as strong as a commercial vacuum, but it's fun. It's related to, because they're a cleaning company. So that's where all the messages tie in. 
Um, so it, it works for them. But then if they are a different, if they're insurance company, we probably wouldn't have suggest the same uh, items. You might get a, a fire extinguisher if you're an insurance agent. Oh, that's a genius idea too. See, these are all practical and useful. See, a fire extinguisher would get kept. Mm -hmm. A little mini vacuum. Agent. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, and then the other item that you had for the cleaning company was a charger. A, a, a charger that, okay, explain how that works. It, it cleans the phone? Yeah, it's, it's used UVC. It's the ultraviolet light that uh, cleans the germ on the phone. Uh, I'm sure that besides me, no one stick the phone to the bathroom. So, but you know, anyway, you should clean it a lot of times, right? Because we we touch on it, you know, it goes, you know, to our face really close. So it's charging the phone and cleans it at the same time. So it, again, it ties into the message that they want to do is their cleaning company. They, uh, they want you to be clean and sanitized. This is genius. So when you are purchasing promotional products for your company, Think about usefulness and not just, in, you know, don't be, don't be cheap. You know, don't go the pen route because they're cheap. Cause you know what, those pens, they, they just, they just get thrown away. Think about something that people are going to hang on to. But what, I, what <laughs> I'm saying is you wanted yeah. to create the experience, not, not yeah. saying that pens are bad, right? For example, you talk about Neil Young. So imagine that uh, the promoter for the event to have Neil Young here and they have a logo pen. So they give you that pen and then you hand it to Neil Young and he signed his name on your book. You're going to keep that pen forever with yeah. their logo on it. So it's about creating the experience and that the item will come second. So you have to have the idea, the experience first and what comes along you know, as the item, people will hang on to it. They, they keep it in the safe, they keep it somewhere or they display it, you know, right? If you got New York signature, that's the pen that he, he signed his name on and it's go onto the wall. So how can you create that experience? It does, sometimes it doesn't matter what, what the cost or the item will be. If you can create the experience and then people will hang on to that item for life. I think you, you wow, I didn't even think about that. But when a president signs a bill into law, he always gives everybody there a pen. Yeah, exactly. What do they do with those pens? Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> they should do but I can totally, that. I can totally imagine if you've got a pen and Neil Young used it to sign his autograph on something, you would display the pen and the, and the autograph together in some sort of case. Mm -hmm. If Neil Young was like your dude, right? <laughs> you know, if you want. Yeah, well, that's, I never really thought about that, but you're, you're absolutely correct. And some people do collect pens. So I guess, I guess my, my, okay. I'm, I've been anti-pen for like the last 15 minutes. And I apologize if you like pens. Sorry. Okay. All right. Let's talk about government. It's the ex experience, you know, like it, it's yeah. just the experience, like how, you know, because we will go to concerts, we pay way over price $50 for a t-shirt. Then if I sell you a t-shirt at let's say Target, it won't have the same effect. You don't, you won't wear it the same day and you won't talk about the experience. So again, you know, going back for the mini efficacy, you want to have the experience. And then even with this pen, I can talk about two hours, how it was signed, where we, where we were being, who was the sponsor. And then again, it goes back around into the same message uh, for mini efficacy. That is true. That's true. Wow. You're opening my mind to this. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I have two more things I want to ask you about. And the first one is when you put in your... Um, I have my guests fill out a, a little form so that I, I can decide whether or not I really want to interview them. And one of the things that you did was you m listed like half a dozen government certifications. I don't even know what any of those are. So why did you go after these government certifications and what does a small business need, owner need to know about the benefits of getting certified by the government? Uh, it's very practical. So when we uh, started, you know, just focus on, promotional product back in 2013. So we are building up again, our client base, you know, when you're a small business, you know, when, when a potential client say, who have you worked with, you know, show us your reference, right? So you're like, eh, like you try to find the biggest company that the people will know. So I think about, we wanted to build on that, but then in order to have larger names at, at, at your client base, you have to start somewhere. And I'm thinking about, who is the number one organization that will give you a lot of business, but then on paper, they can never go out of business. I came to the conclusion that it's the government. They, they can spend unlimited amount if they wanted to, and then they probably won't never go out of business. If, if they are, then we have bigger trouble than, you know, things. So, and I learned from 
studying on that, doing research, they like to work with, they have a set aside for a specific demographic. So you could certify as a women business, which we are, and you can also do a small business enterprise. I'm also a minority. So we are certified as a minority business enterprise. So people will think, you know, sometimes as an immigrant, or if you're a minority uh, listener, then it's a dis disadvantage. And with the certification, we actually raise our hand up high. You know, they actually set aside, if you're a big major corporation, if there's a set aside involved, you actually cannot bid on those projects. So the government is big, you know, there are a lot of, you know, money going in there, but then with those set asides, that could mean billions of funding that are just going to small business. And sometimes they don't, government do, don't do a good job sometimes to advertise their program. But then if you look deep and it's a lot of paperwork, I, I want you, if you want to get into that, a lot of paperwork, you better have your documentation ready, but then there are opportunities uh, in there if you have the right certification. Okay, so if you're not in the United States, I'm sure your government does this. But if you are a woman and you own your business or you own part of your business, if you are a minority and you own a business or own part of a business, or if you have a small business and you're not a minority or a woman, you can apply for one of these government certifications and then raise your hand when the government is looking for somebody who offers the products that you offer or the service that you offer. So it, this is a program that's available to everybody small business women, minorities, not just minorities and women, if you have a small business. All right. Yeah, even if you're in, uh, in a city, cities have their own uh, certification. If you go to your county, county has different certification. If you go to the state and federal, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of certification that goes beyond you know, what we could spend on, but then look, uh, search locally of what's available to you, what are the resources, and then there will actually be people who help you for free. It's a government provider service. They actually have a whole department to help you get certified. You don't have to pay anything. They will guide you through the process. Uh, if you have your paperwork ready, then you know, you're, you're, you're in a good process. So someone will help you fill out the paperwork if you have no idea how to do it. I love this. This, is, yeah. this will, hopefully if you're listening to this and you have a product that can serve the government. And Swire's product is promotional products. Um, there's other, I mean, paper products. There's other- They, they buy anything, yeah. they buy everything. They buy everything. So don't be afraid to try it. Cause what happens if, what happens if your city buys from you and becomes your client? I have a friend who is a, she's a, um, a graphic designer. She gets city contracts all the time. She designs websites for cities because she did one of these programs. And cities pay well. Yeah, and then and going back for for I, I forgot my train of thought. So after I have the the city, the government as my clients, and when client asks me, who have you worked with? Oh, I work with the United States Army. You know, I work with you know the the California state. So then you you becomes this you know you appears to be more uh, larger than what you want to be. We did work with them, but then this will be a good will be good nice to have them on on your belt right as a client client base. So uh, think about there are really a lot of opportunities out there and they do buy and use a lot of things. It's like the law of attraction. The more you have, the more you think about something, the more you have of that something. So if you're constantly thinking of lack, you're going to have lack. If you're constantly thinking about, oh my gosh, I have all these amazing clients. Guess what? You have all these amazing clients. It happens. It happens. This Especially has been a lot of fun. Okay, oh, yeah, go ahead. Especially if you're a buyer, if you're talking about the corporate level, the city level, buyer are very conservative. The last things that they wanted to do is to find a company that didn't work out. So if they know that uh, organization at equal size that buys from you, then you are you know at that level as as far as credibility. So you know think about that when you uh, can work with the city, then you can actually reach out to larger company, a corporate buyer, and then you could you guys can speak the same language. So back to the topic at hand, meaningful introductions, letting people know who your previous clients have been is a way to make a in meaningful introduction of yourself to your new clients. It's all full circle. All right. I have one more question and then we're going to have to wrap up. Okay. Why in the world did you, with everything you've got going on, why did you add kettlebell instructor to that mix? 
I'm really proud of the accomplishment. You know, I always into fitness. And I think about five years ago now, I started, you know, doing kettlebells. I, I listened to Tim Ferriss podcast and he interviewed Powerful Tessulin, which is the chairman of Strong First, uh, which is what I'm certified in. So I think it's fun. You know, there's things to do. And imagine that, you know, you're working remotely or you're working at home, your home office now. You can do work and then you go out, take 10 minutes and do your swing. And then you get, you know, your exercise and you, you're more productive. I think it's a win-win. And I think one of the key point, my highlight in, you know, in the pandemic. Well, we, we like to keep it simple. I think, you know, just learning the swing properly and then, you know, think about what I do. Like I, I'll share my routine a little bit. So every hour or so you're supposed to stand up and walk around, right? If you sit by a desk. So what if you do like 10 swings, 10 kettlebell swings, that's it. Every hour or so you get up, you know, you do 10 swings. Then let's assume that you do eight hours work or 10 hours, right? Then you, you have a hundred swings in every day. So you don't have to sweat yourself. And if you haven't been active, let's say for the last two years, because it's COVID, you know, right? So then it gives you, it, don't, it doesn't burn you out. It gives you more energy. So imagine you do the swing then you get your blood flowing and you come back to work again, then you're more productive. You're a better person. Good advice. I recently bought a standing desk because I was tired of sitting all the time. So I'm yeah, standing right now. Yeah, I'm standing right now. And it's actually, I find that I dance a lot when I'm standing. <laughs> yeah, you move I, around, you, you shift, you shift mm-hmm, a lot. Mm-hmm. It, there is an adjustment when you go from ha- sitting all the time to standing all the time. I, instead of my hips bothering me now, now it's my feet. But I find that your feet stop hurting once you sit down for a little bit. It's time to wrap up. I mean, this has been a really interesting conversation. And you, I have been in marketing for my entire adult life. And I've never looked at promotional products from the angle that you brought today. So I appreciate that. And I, I'm really glad that we had this conversation. Um, and I, if you noticed, I kept my two cents to myself because my, I've had my mind kind of shifted on the way that I thought about promotional products. So thank you for that. Okay, we're gonna wrap thank up. You. This is your <laughs> opportunity to share your moment of gratitude. So for whom or what are you most grateful? I think I'm grateful that you know, I had the opportunities and I actually took on it, you know, when I first started the first company. And obviously, I'm thankful that, you know, me and my wife are business partner for 18 years now. So he should join me uh, two years after I started the company. And we're still married. We're still business partner. So I'm very grateful for that. Thanks for joining us this week for Gratitude Geek, the relationship marketing podcast, helping micropreneurs find your micro influencer magic. Be sure to check the show notes at gratitudegeek.com episode 109 for links to all the groovy resources mentioned today. And while you're there, why not subscribe to the show on Audible, iTunes, Stitcher, or any of your favorite podcast players. There's a simple one button link on the website. Our theme music is track 14 by Rub Rock and So Lily. I've been your host, Candice Rodardi. Join me on my mission to spread gratitude, sow seeds of appreciation, and harvest a bounty of generosity and kindness. Stay groovy, my friends. Can make it easier than they can. We can make it better than before. I know we can make it easier than they can. We can make it better than before. Something <laughs> can't be I'm pretty bossy today, aren't I? Pretty, pretty bossy. Okay.